Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar Italian Fascism 1922-2022 from Mussolini to Meloni. Today, we will discuss about the Italian far right, both in its historical perspective and in the current form, since especially the last general elections in Italy in September 2022. This webinar is a student led initiative in the School of Global Affairs and it will be recorded. I'm Mauro Bonavita, PhD student at King's College London. I will be hosting the webinar today. And special thanks to my colleague Enrico Pulieri, who is a PhD student in the School of Oriental and Africa Studies, SOAS in the University of London, who is co-organizing this. Thanks also to the team of the, King, of the King's College London School of Global Affairs and Vignesh, who are helping us to host this webinar today. Our speaker today is Professor John Foot of the University of Bristol. John is a professor of modern Italian history. He has been author of many books and articles about Italy. Among his books, let me remind Italy's divided memory and the archipelago Italy since 1945. So few house rules before we start. We will, uh, John will kind, uh, kindly agree to speak for 20 to 25 minutes. He will present the topic of today's webinar. After that, we will move to an open Q&A session. If you have questions or you want to raise points, please use the Q&A uh, box that you can find on, uh, on the uh, lower part of uh, the Zoom. Uh, my request is please try to keep your questions short so that we can give a chance to many people to ask questions. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have already collected some questions from our colleagues. We will be happy to add to the one of the publics. Um, so without any further delay, let me invite Professor Foot to make his presentation. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. Uh, thanks to uh, Mauro and Rico for organizing this. and. Um, uh, and hello to everybody who's listening. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about the historic side of fascism, and then I'll come to the current Italian political setup. I'll uh, talk a bit about the elections of, of last year, the current government and who, you know, who Giorgia Maloney is, in my opinion, what's happening in Italian politics, are we in a new phase? Are we not in a new phase? And those are some of the questions. And then we can come to to the further discussion. Um, and some of this may well be um, very well known to you. Some of it might not be. I suppose I've worked between in my career, I sort of work between historical subjects, but I've also, also always um, kept up with Italian politics, written on Italian politics. I actually studied um originally studied politics and not history um and i did my phd in the political science department so i was always between the two worlds and and a kind of connecting up those worlds as well so italian fascism came to power just over 100 years ago uh, in october november 1922 after um a period of intense violence and political struggle within Italy. Some people have referred to that as a period of civil war. Uh, that's a controversial term, but certainly um, the breakdown of state power, the breakdown of the state monopoly of violence, um, and particularly the, the new formation of fascists, which were which organized themselves around, as political bodies, but also as violent militia, which was a new way of doing politics. In fact, it'd be a model for many other governments and experiences in the, in the 20th century. I don't think you get Hitler and Nazism in any kind of significant way without the Italian example or Franco or Portugal or many other examples across the world. And it still remains a very potent symbol of a, a political movement using violence, anti-democratic, anti-institutional, anti-political in some ways uh, to come to power. It's still the inspiration for many people across the world. And fascism remains a word that, um, as somebody we recently wrote, doesn't want to die. It's still used frequently. I mean, if you just search for it on Twitter or something, it will come up a lot every day. We just had the um, attempted coup, or whatever you want to call it in Brazil. Um, Lula called the uh, coup participants or whatever. I don't think it was really a coup, but we could talk about that. He called them neo-fascists. Um, and so that, you know, that word is still a very powerful word or whatever you want to 
frame it. Um, after coming to power through violence, the, the fascist party ruled Italy for 20 years, partly through violence, partly through institutional power, abolishing democracy, getting rid of elections, um, setting up a kind of different kind of state, a corporate state, and, very, and with a very extensive secret police force of informers and um, a very repressive modern state machine. Again, that was copied by many other examples of, of, of dictatorships across the world um, in terms of its methods. And it also connected up to many of those other experiences that you have a kind of international fascism in that period. That regime was very solid, was in some ways popular. That's a very controversial historical uh, point, but in, I think there's no doubt that by the 1930s, particularly with the invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, the regime became to some extent popular, or at least not unpopular. Mussolini himself was often more popular than the actual regime, but made the great mistake of tying themselves to Hitler and Nazism, not just in political terms, but also military terms. And at that point in 1940, Italy entered the Second World War as a minor partner in a in what was essentially Hitler's project for world domination, um, very reluctantly entered that war, wasn't ready for that war. It went badly wrong, and that brought um, crashing down the uh, fascist experience, which I think with most, many historians would agree, without the war would have easily could have carried on. In fact, I've been looking recently at dystopian novels where Mussolini doesn't enter the war, and there's a really interesting kind of genre of novels where um, either Hitler and Mussolini win the Second World War or Mussolini, Italy stays out and Mussolini's old in the 1960s, he's still around. And it's a very interesting idea, you know, this kind of what if history. Um, I think, you know, if it's quite clear that, that the fascist regime was, was not really under any great pressure in 1940. It wasn't particularly popular, but it wasn't, it wasn't going to collapse. It could easily survive for a very long time. Anyway, that, that regime falls. Um, Italy becomes a democracy in 1945. Again, a full democracy for the first time, because women had never voted in Italy. And it sets, it writes this extraordinary constitution, which is still very relevant today. Uh, a kind of beautifully written and structured constitution, which is basically at its heart an anti-fascist constitution in the sense that it doesn't allow for the concentration of power. It disperses power. Um, the, the structures of the Italian state disperse power. They don't allow too much concentration. Um, there's a kind of diarchy at the top, a prime minister and a president. Um, but parliament is, is a very powerful body. But it, it's powerful, but it's also hampered in the way it's very hard to pass laws. So there are two elected chambers relevant to the UK discussion over that, what to do with the House of Lords, for example, which I think is very relevant and interesting. Um, so you set up this, this state, which is actually a very highly democratic state, where many people are very invested in the democratic structures, very high turnouts, very and very powerful political parties in post-war Italy, particularly the the Communist Party and the Christian Democrat Party, which are the two mass parties of post-war Italy, kind of rule in various ways. The Christian Democratic Party is, all, party is almost always the central government main player, but the other parties have local power, have regional power. Italy also has very strong regional government, has very strong local government, much, much stronger than the UK. Um, elected regional government, elect, we have elected local government, but our local government is much weaker in terms of its powers and its stature and its status you know the mayor of an italian city even a small italian city is a very important player um mostly in in the uk that's not the case if that's the comparison that we're going to make so italy was a that always has been a very strong democratic system with very strong constitutional rights and and to some extent a pretty independent judiciary although that comes and goes in various periods. And that's something we could we could possibly discuss. But that set up, that separation of powers was also about the possibility that the, the judiciary could 
um, would never become all powerful, like it, like it had to at some extent being under fascism, but could also challenge power. And we've seen that at key moments in Italian history, particularly in the 1990s, but not just in the 1990s, also with um, the mafia and various other um, fights against um, threats to the state, terrorism as well in the 1970s. One of the parties that was set up in post-war Italy in 1946, to be precise, was called the Italian Social Movement. And that party, the MSI, Movimento Sociale Italiano, was the direct heir of fascism. It, it called itself neo-fascist, it occasionally called itself fascist. It was, and it was set up by people who'd been part of um, Mussolini's regime, often the worst part of Mussolini's regime, the 1943 to five puppet government, which was particularly violent and anti-Semitic. Um, it was set up by a number of veterans from that regime, but it also attracted young people um, who had nothing to do with fascism. And the MSI, you know, was a presence in, it stood in elections. It was a party that's, that played the democratic game, um, although with many ambiguities in post-war Italy. It, it, it stood, in, stood for parliament, it got people elected, it stood in local government. You know, it got between sort of five and 12% of the vote, pretty important, but not, not central, and was always kept out of central power most of the time. They might have had local power occasionally, very rarely actually, but generally uh, the MSI was sort of seen as untouchable. Um, when in 1960, the Christian Democrats needed votes and kind of went to the MSI to form a sort of government, caused absolute scandal and um, riots in Genoa and elsewhere, and that quickly collapsed. And it wasn't until the 1990s, and here we're coming up to kind of the present day, in the 1990s, Silvio Berlusconi, um, a former businessman who had entered politics in 1994, one of the first things he did, he did this even before he entered politics, was actually to spot that there was a vast amount of votes on the right that were being wasted or that could be used to form a majority. And he saw in the MSI votes uh, or that constituency a very a very important ally. And he played a large part in rehabilitating um, the ex-post neo-fascist. At the same time, the neo-fascists themselves were distancing themselves from their past. And they went through a kind of um, process of saying, we're no longer fascist, we're, we believe in democracy, the partisans were right, and so on. Um, under the leader called Gianfranco Fini. So a lot of things were happening around then. And that was Berlusconi basically brought those ex-fascists, post-fascists, whatever you want to call them, back into the political fold. He made them ministers. They were his key allies. And he couldn't have won the elections without them. And they changed their name to Alianza Nazionale. Um, so that was a, you know, a very controversial process. It brought people onto the streets in the 1990s. It brought a lot of people out in to demonstrate. Um, now, Georgia Maloney, when she was young, who is the current prime minister, joined what was then still the MSI. And she has spent her whole life in that, in that political party. It went through lots of name changes, splits, arguments, as many political parties in Italy do. Um, the current manifestation, the one that she runs, is called Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy. But it's a further manifestation of, of that party which came directly from the MSI in 1946. Most notably in its symbol is a flame, which is meant to represent originally the flame on the tomb of Mussolini, um, which is very clearly associated with that tradition. Although they would probably say they weren't anything to do with that, although it's kind of there's a duplicity in that. Now, Georgia Maloney was a fairly minor player, really, in politics. She was a minister. She had local council experience. But in recent times, she's become much more popular. And this is a, a combination of things. Um, one is um, the rebalancing of the forces on the right. At the moment, on the right in Italy, the centre right, let's call it, you've still got Berlusconi who is now indefinitely in political decline, uh, the heady days of the 90s when he would win elections almost on his own. 
are gone and he's still he's still an important player particularly because of his media control but he you know he's not he's not what he was and you've also got the Lega, which is an ex-regionalist party um very populist very racist um who were for a moment in the night in recent times the big party but have have declined so maloney comes through the right has understood in italy that to, to win the election you need to unite uh if you don't if you're not united you're going to lose that's the way the electoral system works the left whatever you want to call it we can go back to that later was not united and was bound to lose in the in last year's elections i mean there was no way with lots of first past the post seats that um the a divided constituency a lot of divided set of organizations was going to win uh the right was destined to win the important thing was who was going to be the major player in that in that right center right and maloney became the leader really de facto leader of that triumvirate of leaders berlusconi salvini and maloney although there's quite a lot of bartering around that and i think i would say for two reasons one is the other two have been become highly discredited in recent years around the covid pandemic uh in particularly salvini made a lot of mistakes in the covid pandemic um the other and and maloney also stayed out of a kind of grand coalition where which every other party joined under the technocrat uh draghi so she was able to say none of this mess is anything to do with me um but she also was able to to kind of um link up to some of the quite powerful anti novax movements and anti lockdown movements that grew up in Italy which is not our whole constituency but it's certainly part of it and the conspiracy theories uh, which have which were quite powerful in Italy around that so she had been outside so she won the election alongside her allies in in last year's election and I just just two things to conclude and then we'll I'll come back to some of them later the first question is and this links to the early part of my talk is she a fascist is she a danger to democracy um and the second question is you know sort of connected to that what is where is Italy today where does it stand what are its problems first question um she's not a fascist um she's not going to abolish democracy she's not going to lead squadristi marching on parliament however having said that you don't need to dig very far into her party and her followers to find a lot of people who are big fans of Mussolini um, and have very problematic ideas about um, some of the democratic processes and rights and so on in Italy, not least something like abortion. So that doesn't make her a fascist being anti-abortion, but it certainly makes her on the far right of politics. And that I think if we're talking in terms of memory, I think there are some very problematic things going on about historical memory and how to understand the past. And we'll see this play out, for example, on the 25th of April, which is Liberation Day. What, what will Georgia Maloney do? I think she'll play a very straight game and, you know, say the right things. What her followers will do, hmm, not so sure. Um, I think they won't play a straight game. So you have a kind of double you know a states a states person like approach mixed with a lot of stuff that's very very problematic and that kind of leads me to where Italy is um this is a proper political government for the first time in quite a long time Italy has has been going through emergency governments technical governments technocratic governments or governments that don't make any sense like five star plus Lego which was never gonna make any sense this makes sense politically <laughs> they won the election they're going to govern as a majority um and that is something new actually in recent time, times that hasn't happened for quite a long time so that is something kind of normal in most democracies but not in recent Italian political times and then there's a whole load of economic pain coming down the line which this government cannot resolve on its own um and is in fact some ways worse in Italy in other places so that's going to be very interesting to see how that's dealt with um by this government which is a moment is playing a very I would say quite a conservative political game while maintaining a populist stance when it needs to it's worth underlining that Maloney is incredibly popular at this point 
Um, we have seen this before. I think twice in recent times, political leaders have grown massively after taking power and have then very quickly declined. So I don't know what's going to happen with Maloney, but we saw it with Renzi and we saw it with Salvini. So let's wait and see. But at the moment, there's no there's no sign of any decline. On the contrary, every single poll um, that they go up. Um, there may be a limit to this, but let's see. And 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 the final point is is whether fascism matters in Italy. I think one of the points I would make is that anti-fascism was a driving force um, in post-war Italy. It was an important mobilizing force for many people. I wouldn't argue, I would argue that's that's in decline today. It's not something that mobilizes people. It's not something that makes them change their vote. Um, in any way like the 1960s or the 19 even the 1990s um and it's not something that interests a lot of people um so i think that has happened and and that is somehow also generational because the last partisans the last anti-fascists from fascism and from the war are dying there aren't many left that direct experience is not there so how do you transmit that value to a new generation has it been transmitted and finally you know if it hasn't will fascism mean to young people as much as the risorgimento meant to someone in 1946 i mean that is a very i think a very crucial question i i and i won't answer it now i i don't know what the answer is but i'll that is a question to ask i think i'll stop there thank you Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this fascinating presentation. There are a lot of elements you already mentioned, but it could be interesting to go through them. I see that there's already a question, some questions in the chat, so please add them there. We're going to move to them in a minute. But before, I wanted to ask you a couple of things from your presentation. The first one is very interesting. You mentioned fascism as a phenomenon which kept together on one side violent power on the other side institutional power and this is something that it's interesting in a wider um how should i say context of the far right that we see today because of course we see certain countries in the european union when there are far right governments which are not exercising violence but they are certainly restricting freedoms through institutional uh, power and then we all watch the terrible images a few days ago in uh, Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, fortunately, there was no, uh, no major breakdown of democracy because institutions were able to, to survive the same in America, but certainly there we can see something very similar to, the, to what Squadristi were doing in the 1919 and 1920. So my first question would be, how do you frame uh, the current far right in, the, in, in this context and why there is so much you think uh, fear from the press and from uh, public opinion, especially in Europe about the victory of uh, Meloni, or at least there was a few months ago. Is it because of the historical heritage, because of some kind of stereotype in respect of Italian democracy? Is it because uh, really there's uh, the fear of seeing something similar? The second element, you very interestingly mentioned the role of the MSC, the Italian social movement, Movimento Sociale Italiano, now, we know very well that the generation, the older generation of brothers of Italy, they, are all, they were all children of an Italian social movement. They were all involved, especially in the 1970s, in riots, in uh, uh, activities of the social movement, which even if they were not openly uh, violent, they were certainly, let's say, very close to that. They had a very ambiguous position in terms of using violence. I'm thinking about the current president of the Senate, uh, in Azzo La Russa, as you mentioned, Italy has a bicameral system where both chambers uh, legislate. So even the Senate is very important in Italy. Um, how do you think the way that party, which, as you said, was outside democracy, the way they saw reality and democracy, how much is it influencing to do today? How much is it shaping the way the current brothers of Italy see the rest of the world? For example, we know that Meloni is very uh, pro-American, something which the Italian social movements, which 
critical to a certain extent or more ambiguous. So how do you think this uh, heritage is, is in place? Thank you. There's a, a great questions. Um, we'll start on the first one, the far right. I think, I think that's, you know, there's an historical point there about populism, where it comes from. Um, and in some ways, Italy is a, a laboratory for that. You know, Berlusconi, you could argue, is is the first. And I think there's a real problem with the way he isn't taken seriously outside of Italy, in some ways inside Italy, but generally outside of Italy. I get very frustrated with the media, for example, the way they present him as a kind of joke figure or a kind of um, something inconsequential. Whereas actually what you when you when you look at Berlusconi, it's a very serious and innovative political project um very successful and and that populism um which came after the end of the fall of the berlin wall is is something you can see in most countries um uh, in different forms um even to the ukip in in the in the uk and and uh, orban and uh, to some extent even macron comes out of that tradition i mean almost everybody and it infected all the other parts of the italian political system I and mean, all of them went kind of leader centric um they went for light parties that the big political party no longer exists really anywhere in the world uh, on that level it's a very the media um centered party and then social media has another impact on that i think in terms of the current italian political government it places itself very firmly in a in a sort of the, the main allies of um of the, of the leaders of the of the current were orban and putin um but i think since being elected i think that that's softened to some extent um particularly maloney who is a politician who's always been in politics i think is much more kind of um conservative in her outlook and they want to stay in power and they want power within the eu um so they're, they're kind of slightly realigning themselves there i think in those terms and that kind of leads to the second question about the the kind of legacy of the msi um i think on the one hand you have this kind of unreconstructed nostalgia whatever you want to call it for for fascism, which you can see in La Russa, you can you can see in someone like Isabella Rauti. Um, and interestingly, they're both children of fascists. Um, and they both make reference to that in recent communications. You know, this is this is just honoring my parent. Um, you know, it's nothing, to, it's not political. It's it's almost emotional in those terms. I think a lot of that kind of the politics of the MSI has had to change. And had to, had to adapt uh, some of the anti-Atlanticism. Um, I don't think that's really there anymore. Um, I don't think those kind of things are there. I don't think La Russa has it actually much much impact on policy. Um, particularly, he's not he's not really a policy maker. He's more of a figurehead uh, in, in in today's world. So, but I will I would be very careful to keep an eye on what they're going to do with Italian institutions. I mean, everybody has tried to reform the Italian institutions over the last 20 years has basically failed. Um, but Asconi talked was in power for 10 years and talked about reforming the judiciary and did absolutely nothing. Every time he tried to do it, it failed. So they may try and reform the presidential system. Whether they will succeed, I think is very unlikely. In fact, the, the biggest reform of the last 20 years was under was was carried out thanks to the five star movement um which was the massive decrease in the numbers of parliamentarians um which no one talks about but which i think is isn't it is is a very important um shift and no one's actually I, I i'm not saying it's good or bad but it is certainly something quite extraordinary that you would cut the parliamentarians are and have a referendum on it um by that number i can't see any other country doing that um the other thing to mention which i forgot to mention um earlier was was the very low turnout in the last election i think this is another thing the party of people who don't vote 35 percent i mean that's the old days what the christian democrats used to get right um that's a lot of people and so there is a there is a crisis of participation and disaffection with the political system and that isn't good for anybody and I think that is a, probably an international thing as well.
in many countries, not all countries, but in many countries. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting point. I think we will come back to the institutional reforms because it's important. But first, my colleague Enrico has a question, then we will move to the audience. Please, again, add your questions on the, in the chat box. Thanks. Thank you, Mauro, and thank you again also to Professor John Foot for this uh, wonderful presentation about our country. Uh, the question that I have uh, is related to the fact that we know Italy has a particular, sometimes controversial um, relationship with the European Union, both from the political and the institutional point of view. So I would like to ask to Professor Foot, how do you see the political and institutional relationship with the European Union? Uh, for example, from the institutional point of view, Meloni as a prime minister, but probably even more interesting from the political point of view with the controversial um, European allies. And yeah, uh, I mean, a second, yeah, yeah. And maybe a, a second point of, of the question, which may be the future perspective of the evolution of Italian European politics for the UK also. Um, so yeah, thank you for those. Um, on the EU, well, uh, of course, Italy for such a long time was one of the sure bets in Europe. I mean, it had a very, very pro-European population. It was one of the founder members of the of the EU. It was one of the you know the six core nations. It had very strong participation in uh, European institutions and so on. Um, that began to change with the euro um, and the rise of populist parties, many of whom, whom were quite hostile to the EU, but they were also tapping into hostility to, to the euro. I think the euro is much more unpopular or was much more popular than the EU itself. Um, and that had an effect. And, you know, for a time, um, you know, there was a danger, I think, that not really of an Italian exit, but you know, it was on. It wasn't an incredible idea, especially when a number of parties were pushing it, including the Five Star and Lega. Um, maybe you know the Euro crisis of 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 when Berlusconi was last in power, and so on. So there's been a change in that relationship, um, and um, and it's not such a strong relationship either in terms of popularity or in terms of institutional power. Nonetheless, I think Brexit was a cautionary tale um, and none of the um, populist leaders are now calling for anything. They, they like to criticize. I think um, they like to use the EU or Germany. Sometimes they're, they're kind of merged in together as a, a useful sort of sounding board saying, you know, blame everything on Germany, let's blame everything on the EU. Um, but they also want the money, and they also realise too it would be completely bonkers to uh, to <laughs> to cut yourself off as um, we have so cleverly done in our own country. <laughs> and you can see the consequences of that. I don't think anyone will do it again, to be honest. Even Orban, you know, realises that. Um, so I think it's it's difficult relationship. It's a complicated relationship. Um, Maloney has made the right noises, um, and I think is playing. A quite solid political game um, in terms of European alliances, European, and I think the fear, and this comes back to something I didn't answer before, uh, which Mara asked about this sort of fear of Maloney. I don't think that's really come to pass. I think that partly there's part there's a partly a sort of lazy, you know, Maloney is a fascist, and and that's fascism back, and Mussolini is back, kind of stuff, which is. Which is kind of pointless, and I, I don't see the point of that. Even that discussion, it doesn't. It's not really going anywhere. But there's also a kind of Italy's a basket case, lazy stereotype as well, um, which, um, looking from UK, now looks uh, increasingly um, like we're the basket case, um, if anybody is. Um, but I think a Melonius is is a politician is going to play real politics while obviously using keeping her populist cards up her sleeve and align with Orban when she wants to, but I think she would like to build a much wider coalition. And, you know, it'd be interesting if Le Pen wins in France, which is not impossible one day. Um, that will be two of the major countries in Europe governed by, you know, I don't know if it'll be Le Pen anymore, but 
ex neo fascist, post fascist, whatever you want to call it, that would be an extraordinary moment. And it's not impossible at all. Um, I think on your question on the of the I think your second part of your question was on on the alliances in Europe, and I've kind of just answered that. But um, I think a lot of this is at the level of rabble rousing and, you know, building alliances, breaking alliances, um, strizzali locchio, they say in Italian, sort of winking at certain things. It's for domestic political consumption, especially around the hot issue of immigration. Um, but when it comes down to actual decisions, actual money, actual funding, I don't think there'll, I think there'll be a lot of continuity, um, you know, like there has been throughout the last 20 years, you know, Berlusconi talked, uh, taught the talk about the EU and Euro, never did anything um, concrete there, took the money and, and um, you know, was fairly conservative, really. I mean, and when they wanted to get rid of him, they got rid of him, rid of him. <laughs> as you saw in the 2011, when, when the EU didn't want him anymore, that was the end of him. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I think when they don't want Maloney, they can put pressure on and that hasn't happened yet. Perfect. Thank you, John. So let's move now to the questions from the audience. Let's uh, take a couple. So we have uh, Stefano Bottini who is asking Mussolini had British influences for his rise. I mean, about the financing of the Avanti newspaper or the controversial correspondence with Churchill. Why Meloni has American ultra-conservative support? I'm thinking about Steve Bannon or Trump. It's curious, but the far right always need external support, even if it presents itself as a movement that defends the nation. But which one? So this is the first question. The second question comes from Sheba Tejani, uh, and is, I would be interested to know more about your understanding and definition of fascism. I suppose that is a question underlying a lot of today's discussion. Then we will move to the other questions. John. Sorry, John, you're muted. We cannot hear you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I can see those questions. Thank you very much, Stefan. That's a great question. Um, and in some ways, you know, you you um you answer it yourself. But um, you know, all movements have international links, all movements have international allies and and non-allies. I think the you know the, the also there's also the Putin connection with with Maloney with Salvini with Berlusconi which is very powerful, um, but I don't, I'm not a big fan of of kind of dietrologia particularly which is kind of looking behind for everything and not what's on the surface what's actually happening. Um, sure, I mean Maloney's some of Maloney's politics have been inspired by kind of populist politics, but I think most of her politics are kind of old style right wing msi type politics you know kind of social fascism the msi was was in favor of a welfare state it was in favor of social spending it was in favor in some extent of trade unions uh, you know it's not a thatcherite um ideology they don't really have a free market idea of the state and i think that that's been continued. They have a very kind of managerial, um, the state is a set of resources, you know, perhaps in a corrupt way, um, is to be kind of distributed and, you know, within a, a fairly large welfare state. Um, and uh, of course they came in partly, there's the whole question of the five-star policy on income, guaranteed income. But if you take that out of it, they're not going to change very much there. So, I, yes, I think those things are there, Bannon and Trump, but I don't think they're crucial to understanding at least Maloney. They're more interesting to understand Salvini, but I think his day is coming to an end. I mean, he's now kind of shouting into the <laughs> into the void. I think every time he opens his mouth, less people are going to vote for him because they're not listening anymore. And I think that that will be interesting to see how the Lega repositions itself. There, there's a lot of pressure on his leadership. He's he's lost that election quite badly. Anyway, there's a lot more to say there. Definition of fascism. Yeah, that's a bit of a hot potato. Um, I think, you know, that there are millions of definitions of fascism. And and exactly, you, you make the point very well. What do we mean when we use this word? It means 
tons of different things. Does it mean, you know, a violent movement that wants to install a dictatorship? Does it mean um, an anti-political, um, anti-democratic movement? It can mean a lot of things, and it has meant a lot of things. And I, you know, un under any of those definitions, uh, Maloney's government is not any of those. Um, is it, you know, supporting fascism from the past? Well, maybe, um, but I think it's not, you know, it's it's the word itself is is very is becoming very problematic, um, and is almost meaningless in some ways, and and it just it carries so much emotion. When you call someone a fascist, then it just closes down a discussion. You don't. That's the end of discussion. They're fascists. They're bad. Let's not talk about it anymore. As opposed to actually talking about what they're actually doing, I'm I'm really in favour of um, of talking about what actually is going on, as opposed to, um, you know, labels. Um, I would, however, as I said before, be very worried about kind of memory memory wars and rewriting the past, and I think some of that is happening. An historian, I'm very concerned about that. So. That's what's something I'm keeping very much my eyes on. Um, I don't know if you want to go to the other two. Yes, thank you very much for this. So we have Tommaso Visone who is asking how much of the old program of Almirante to bring the MSI outside the shadow of fascism, also promoting Fini, the more moderate and transformist of its hair, a successor, is still present in Meloni attitudes. Is she fully succeed in it? Um, let's remind the audience that Almirante was the historical leader of the Italian uh, social movement. Then we have a couple of questions from Alex Kalinikos. Um, John, it sounds as if the economic con uh, the connection between the Fratelli and classical fashion is poorly historical and that Meloni is just another right wing parliamentary leader in the mold created by Berlusconi. Is that right? And then Meloni's politics is old style MSI, social fascism. How does that fit with the care? with which she has not challenged a new economic orthodoxy? Um, thanks for those. Um, I'll start with Tommaso. Um, I think <laughs> it's a good question. Where does she relate to the history of the MSI? I mean, she grew up in that party. She's That's her life. That's her political life. That party has changed a lot and gone through lots of ramifications, has modernised um, and so on. She also is very good. I mean, it's, her in, image is very interesting. Woman, first female prime minister. We, we, we kind of forget a lot of that stuff. Mother, single mother. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things there in the way she's presented herself, um, which are not necessarily political, but we have helped her win. There's no doubt about that. Her image has been very carefully cultivated in certain ways, which are actually quite unusual for Italy. Um, and I think that is very interesting. Um, has she kind of um, achieved Almirante's aim? To some extent, the respectability of the far right, yes, for sure. When you were at 30% in the polls, no doubt. Um, I think that with Almirante, that was a much more ambiguous project because there were a whole series of things going on under the surface um, with violence, with links to strategy of tension, which was a kind of destabilizing force those things aren't really around today but they certainly were around in Almirante's time so I think in some ways she's she is a much more respectable politician in that sense than Almirante was and but they do spend a lot of time rehabilitating Almirante and trying to name streets after them which should never happen because he was a he was a fascist and he was an anti-Semite and he was involved in the Holocaust and all kinds of things um coming to Alex's hello Alex um, how are you? Um, coming to Alex's question. Um, first one. Yeah, I think I, I wouldn't go that. I, I would. I think she is pretty similar to. I, I think in some ways she's a Christian Democrat. You know, um, I think the far right Christian Democrat politics. I think we've seen that in her practical actions um, and pronouncements. And she wants to stay in power. And and to stay in power, that's that's going to win you the centre ground. Um, in Italy, which is what what she needs, and to remain head of that of that coalition. So then, as I said at the past, there's there's the kind of environment of her party, people like Larissa, who come who are very un, unapologetic about you know Mussolini was a great man. Larissa has a room of stuff of Mussolini, 
in his house. I mean, in Italy, he's often seen as a kind of joke figure. I think he's just quite a, a very interesting person to study in the 70s, a hardcore political militant on the streets with the MSI. Now is a kind of cuddly, cuddly joke figure. But, you know, there's that really dark and worrying edge. And again, I think we'll see that in the memory wars more than anywhere else. I don't we'll see it in particularly in politics. And your second question, Alex, um, she hasn't challenged the EU economic orthodoxy because it won't make any difference um, whether she does or not, because it's not going to change. Um, I don't think there's any um, any danger of that. Um, I think they see the EU as a source of funding, a source of uh, handouts that they can use, um, and but also as something to bash whenever that serves their purposes. Um, so uh, I think, you know, they're not, um, when I say they're pro-welfare state, um, I think they're not going to, they're not free marketeers is what I mean. They're not sort of, they're not Thatcher ideologues on that. You'll never, you'll never hear them talking in that way, but they're not going to, that doesn't mean they're not going to, um, they're not, yeah, that challenging the EU is, is on, on that point of view is, is pointless for them. They didn't see any political capital to be gained from that. Thank you very much, John. For this, I would like to go back to one of the points you made in the in your answer in your, one of your answers. How much does fascism matter in Italy today? And my question is: You studied a lot of fascism in the 1940s and immediately after the war, and we see that today there is uh, this kind of narrative which goes around it, especially in the brothers of Italy, but not just there. My question is, did 50 years of Christian Democrats government and majority in the country and the presence of a very strong communist party didn't allow Italy to develop a national idea, a democratic national idea, so that, that uh, nostalgia for that kind of past can be uh, in, used by radical political parties to try to you know, capture people you know, the, the anti-fascism of the Christian Democrats was a very stale anti-fascism. I mean, that was in many ways in 68, a lot of people rebelled against that, that kind of anti-fascism, which was kind of a lot of very, very boring ceremonies um, in front of monuments and kind of the same words every year. There wasn't a galvanizing anti-fascism. I think, I mean, I think an interesting question is, what happened between 94 and today? So in 94, Berlusconi brings these ex-fascist ministers into government for the first time, and there's huge demonstrations. I was in Milan then, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people outraged, absolutely outraged. You know, it's like, this is this cannot happen in Italy. Now, 25, nearly 30 years later, um nothing right tiny demonstrations no real protest no outrage particularly there is some outrage but not much um so what's happened i think and to answer my own question i don't have the entire answer one is the normalization of that kind of um politics you know since 94 alianza nazionale or fratelli d'italia politicians have governed numerous local governments numerous regional governments have been in government in national politics for years so it's normalized there's no the outrage has kind of worn itself out okay but i also think there's something more fundamental going on which is the end of those mass parties who who had been born on on the back of anti-fascism particularly the communist party and the socialist party to some extent um you know the generational change the the fact that there are no ex-partisans anymore. If you went into Italian parliament, even in the 1990s, you'd still find people who fought on the mountains in the, in the, in the war against fascism. None of those people are around anymore. Um, and as I come back to that point, this is, is this as important for a young person today in Italy as the resurgence, as Garibaldi was for people, you know, in 46, like basically something from the past and that it doesn't galvanize anymore. Anti-fascism doesn't galvanize. Other things galvanize the environment. You know, um, other things move people to the streets. Um, strikes, jobs, pay, inflation, other things. But 
fascism doesn't move people to the streets um as you know if it just if, if there was a, a coup or something like that yeah sure people would come out but it it doesn't it doesn't move people in the way it did in 1994 and i think that's really interesting um and important and a very important change because that was you know part of the the ideology however you want to think about it that dominated post-war um post-war italy and is part of the constitution Perfect. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions from the audience, I might just ask you a final comment on what type of lessons should Europe, the UK learn from the last elections? And uh, then we can conclude our webinar. Um, I'm not sure about lessons, but I think I think there's a tendency um, to see Italy through various stereotypes, which are, are not particularly helpful um and you know i think it's it, it's it's not really a sort of preaching about to look at what's actually going on but it's all it's it's kind of it would be great if we could just everybody could all the media could wake up tomorrow and just get rid of all those stereotypes in one one fell swoop you know unstable um eccentric full of crazy characters all this kind of stuff you know it just it just it always gets in the way of actually looking what's happening um and i think that that's that that kind of thing we're always fighting against when when we talk about italy um in any in any sphere so i think that you know that will be interesting it'll be useful one of the lessons is yes to look at what history is what people are saying what they what their past is but also to look what they actually do and and try and understand it that way um and you know i think the, the decline of the foreign correspondent, for example, is is something that used to be really helpful in, in in explaining Italy to to readers in newspapers and so on. And that really that figure doesn't really exist in the same way as it used to. So that's the kind of appeal, as opposed to a question about lessons. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let me thank again Professor John Foot for speaking with us today and this interesting webinar. And let me thank all the attendants for joining us today. We will be hosting another webinar at the end of February on Italian foreign policy. And then in March, we will be talking about Italian economic politics and uh, debt management. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good rest of the day. Thank bye you. Bye.